Welcome to Solutions with Courtney Anderson, and I'm Courtney Anderson. This is episode 207. Every time we record a show, and I think, really? 207? Wow. Of this show. 207 episodes. So thank you for being here and allowing us to provide 207 episodes of this program. (laughs) This is a show that is part of the Joyful Art of business series and of course that is the series where we are looking at the complete holistic return on our investment in terms of our professional endeavors so whether it's paid or it's nonprofit or it's a volunteer how do we feel when we do our work or our business do we feel joyful we should feel joyful more often than not not that we're gonna be joyful every second of every moment of every day But that overall, yeah, it works. If we're miserable, if we despise it, if I ask you, how's your job? And you'd say to me, oh, my boss, or, you know, my boss is all right, but my coworker, or you say to me, my coworkers are all right, but my customer, these people, I can't stand and they're disgusting. Or if you say to me, eh, the job's all right, but the commute, or, or, you know, whatever it is that you're complaining that make, that you say is making you miserable. And I believe you. My point isn't that that you're wrong, that your job is super awesome. My point is that if it's not bringing more joy than misery to your life, you need to move on. You're not going to quit your job today. You're not going to leave in a huff. What you're going to do is start asking yourself, why are you here? Why do you continue to put yourself in situations that aren't bringing you that emotional, that psychological, uh, that mental, that physical positive response? This is your life. This is it. Today is the, is it. Whatever day it is on the calendar, to the best of my knowledge, it's to be the only day we have in our whole experience in this body, in this life, as we understand it, this day. This was it. This was the day. Yeah, every day. So what are you doing if you're miserable? Stop. And my other part of my argument is that you have to take accountability for your unique contribution to us to humanity I call that art whatever you do you do it in your way and that means something and I always think about the examples they'll have them now they'll be you know, I guess a viral internet thing but it'll be like a crossing guard or someone somewhere in the world right who has a job that you think that's not an interesting job you know you stand there and hold a sign or something or you direct people to go this way but they you know maybe they dance or maybe they do something really fun with it and then it goes all over the world and what why is that getting attention around the world because people look at that and they think see you can make your own imprint on anything and that's an accurate assessment and that's why that's why I'm calling it art so in the Joyful Art of Business, this show today is one that I'm already <laughs> getting emotional about. And uh, some some of you in the community may think, when are you not emotional? <laughs> you know, whether it's super, you know, passionate and, 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 and uh, assertive or it's, you know, emotion laden. When are you not emotional? Well, I I'm actually don't see myself as being particularly emotional at all. I think I'm really passionate about things. Part of that is what we just talked about in this entire series. I try to pick things to do on each of my individually unique days in life, that calendar day and that year that will never come again. I try to pick stuff that brings me more often than not joy. So when I'm doing that thing, that thing, just like that crossing guard that you see the video and you think, wow, they're really into that. Yeah, because that brought them joy. That's what I'm doing. This is my thing. And if you just hung out with me and I was you know, doing laundry or something that wasn't part of my you know, super exciting daily adventure, then I wouldn't be as um, excited. Just like if we went and hung out with the crossing guard who, you know, dances, they wouldn't be doing that when they're, you know, brushing their teeth. But they found an expression and they found a place to to let a little bit of what makes them uniquely glad to be alive come out. And they did it, and so do I. So, yeah, I can, I can, I can be passionate. But I know today's show is going to be one that really does <laughs> bring it out in me. Uh, today's topic is for, um, for episode 207. It is ask for what you want and 
be prepared to get it. Ask for what you want. And be prepared to get it. Now, this is a quote from uh, Maya Angelou, who uh, passed away at 86 years young uh, in 2014. What a wonderful amount of years. 86 years young. And we did an episode, episode, uh, I believe, 199. You have to Come to CourtneyAnderson.com. As you know, that's our main website. We've got all of these individual uh, shows have show pages. And we've got our other companion uh, video or television shows. We've got webinars, seminars, ebooks, online classes, uh, all kinds of exciting things. So please continue to bookmark us and use us as an ongoing library and resource. Uh, so we did a program, uh, I believe episode 199, from another Maya Angelou uh, powerful quote uh, that you have not listened to that show I encourage you to to, to do so uh, that that show and that quote was never make someone a priority when all you are to them is an option Ooh, I get chills uh, just just thinking back to that that episode so please please um, and if you don't know much about Maya Angelou other than you maybe you've read uh, her seminal uh, novel. I know why the cage bird sings, or maybe you've just not. Maybe you haven't even read that. Uh, please take the time. Whenever we hear about somebody who uh, is is noted, you know, in the media, in the public, an author, a painter, a sculptor, an an athlete, even if you think, well, that's not anything I'm interested in, right? Like I don't care about that sport, or I'm not interested in sculpting. The fact that that person, out of the literally at this point over 7 billion people on the planet had contributed enough to be noticed or noted read it read about them take take three minutes out of your life and go on the internet or go to your library and just get a little taste of why they were even publicly noted there's nothing but uh, a benefit that will um, be bestowed in your life by learning about these individuals so just do that all right uh, and of course on the website coordination.com I've got uh, links to different articles and and the link to where this show title came from um, and other just as a just as a starter if you don't really know where to where to go so this show topic ask for what you want and be prepared to get it uh, it also is a is is emotional for me because we had the another uh, program that we did and it was uh, from a quote uh, that was from uh, one of my grandmothers and of course um, she was just amazing and uh, I say of course most people have uh, fond um, people in their lives and if and if we've quoted someone it usually means that they were someone of note or someone maybe that we've we'd read about it or, or enjoyed their work or maybe it was someone in, in in our own lives and so when I'm you know you would just guess if it's someone that I'm using a quote that I knew in my own life that they probably meant something to me in a positive way if they were someone that I thought was you know not super awesome I probably wouldn't have wouldn't have quoted them so uh but episode uh, 148 so it was a little while ago now episode 148 uh, my grandmother's name was Edith Heslop. It's my uh, father's mother. And that show title was, uh, topic was, You Get No More Out of Life Than You Demand. You get no more out of life than you demand. And that is something uh, that I think ties into the first part of this Maya Angelou show topic today. So the first part of the Maya Angelou show topic today is ask for what you want. And I think that ties in somewhat to what my grandmother I uh, was trying to, to encourage, and I again, please do ask you to, to to check out that show if you haven't. I've got links on the show page to um, her being interviewed, actually. And um, it's a little bit more of why. Like I said, we, you know, like I, I just encouraged you a little while ago. When you see somebody and you read something, and, and I said it doesn't, it's going to benefit you to go see, you know, a little bit more about them, then I would ask the, the same for my grandmother. 
uh, just a wonderful, wonderfully um, assertive person. She's someone who I can honestly say, and I don't really think there's anybody who knew her that would say she didn't get everything out of life that she wanted. She really did. It's not one of these things where, oh, you know, I know she always dreamed of doing this, or if only, you know, maybe she had lived at a different time, she could have done these things, or no, she really did. She is someone who left no stone unturned, and uh, that, I think, is one of the most amazing gifts. It's interesting. I, I'll meet people sometimes socially, and, you know, when you talk to people socially, and I'll say things, you know, along the lines of, I don't really have any regrets. And and people sometimes will be a le- not very um, receptive to that concept. And then, well, don't you regret this? Don't you regret that you didn't do that? Or you didn't go here? Or you didn't marry that person? Or you didn't do this? And I'm like, well, no, I really not, no. Because if there's something I want to do, I do it. That gets you to a point where you don't have the regrets. Now, it's not that there's stuff that I haven't done that I'd like to do. It's not that there's stuff that I did that I found out I didn't really like or that wasn't wasn't fun at all. What it means is that if there's something that I that I that I that I you know secretly harbor or that I covet, I go out and do that thing. So then that way, t- stone uh, has been turned over, right? No stone left unturned, and now I'm not sitting around anxiety ridden and worried about what would have happened if I'd done that because I when I did it. So part of what that show in the first part of this um, show today, ask for what you want, that to me seems like the easiest part of all of this. Like I just said, if you don't want to have regrets, then just sit around and think about the stuff that you really want to do and then make a plan and a strategy and execute and go do that stuff. I'm not saying you're going to do it at the level that you want to do it, right? So I might think, oh, I love swimming. I actually do love swimming. So when I was younger as a kid, I mean, you know, I did, I did swim and um, really enjoy it, right? I love tennis really enjoyed it. I was on tennis team, you know, in like junior high or something. Now, am I someone who, to the best of my knowledge, has or had the athletic ability to be, you know, um, Billie Jean King or uh, Venus and, or Serena Williams? Uh, no. That doesn't mean I don't enjoy tennis. doesn't mean that I didn't have fun when I did it then. I got some ribbons, mostly just for showing up. <laughs> and I enjoy it now. So it's not like my dream was I had to be, you know, I had to win Wimbledon. My dream was just to do it. So I did it. That's why when I say I have no regrets, it also was being very honest with yourself. Some people get so caught up on the specifics of it all. So like I said, some people would say, well, I play tennis too, but I have so many regrets because I wanted to be on the, you know, Olympics and I didn't make it. And then they get all angry and all this kind of stuff. And my point is simply that when we put unrealistic expectations on ourselves, then it makes life really difficult. The other thing is, what do you want? And I've talked about this in so many of our programs. Because, you know, our foundational principles are surpassing our goals. I talk constantly about, of course, the topic series that we have today, our show series today, Joyful Art of Business. But all of this is predicated on what do you want? I can't tell you I don't have any regrets if I didn't know what I wanted to do to begin with. I can't tell you that, you know, you should ask for what you want and then be prepared to get it. If if the response you say to me is, I don't know what I want. We did a show a while ago. On um, you know, how am I supposed to uh, follow my dreams? I don't my when I don't know what my dreams are, right? And 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 all of that is the first part of this this show today. How am I supposed to know? You know, how am I supposed to follow my dream? How am I supposed to ask for what I want? How am I even supposed to know? How do I supposed to know what I want? And these types of uh, questions, they're not silly. I mean, these are central questions to life I, I i'm unable to you know get what i want out of life if i don't i'm unable to demand what i want out of life i'm unable to ask for what i want i'm unable to say that i don't have any regrets i'm unable to have this joyful uh work situation if if i don't even i don't even know you know i don't even know what i want and so that issue of understanding what you want so you can ask for it oh my goodness so important so important so what's the answer to the question how do you find out what you want right before i can ask for what i want and be prepared to get it or the other show topic right i'm getting no more out of life than i demand how can I do all this stuff if I don't even know what it is that I want? 
Uh, we did a show where we talked about you need to take responsibility for creating a process where you can get access to what you want. And that may sound weird. I understand you are you and you're inside your own mind and body. But a lot of us don't have the time and we haven't prioritized determining what it is that we want to do, what makes us happy. And so we did a show where we talked about uh, setting up a physical space where you're going to go to your, you know, idea generation location. So if you didn't listen to that show, check out the links on courtanderson.com on the show page and, and or just go find that, that show and listen to it because I talked about that. you got to have a process. Most people get into a part of, a, of their life where everything is on autopilot. So I'm going to go to sleep at this time because this is what time I go to sleep every day because I know i got to get up at a certain time tomorrow because i got to go do all of the things I normally do. i got to you know take care of my family if I am a stay-at-home um, household manager. So i got to get up at a certain time. i got to get ready for my kids. i got to take care of my maybe elderly relatives. I've got to take care of other uh, people. i got to transport people. i got to feed people. i got to get that done. And then i got to run errands, and I have to clean the house, and I have to you know make sure that things get repaired. And then, you know, so everything's dictated. It's on autopilot. Or if someone works outside the home, it's the same thing. I got to go to bed now because I got to get up at certain times. That's when I got to go to the commute and I got to commute to the office. And I got to go to the office and I got to do with the, the office. And then when I leave the office, I got to go pick up some things and then I got to run errands. And I got to pick people up and I got to come home and then I'm going to eat and then I'm going to go to the bathroom and then I'm going to go to sleep. And it's on autopilot and it's like every day is the same as the other day. And then every once in a while, there's a day where maybe it changes a little bit. Maybe that's a weekend or the day off or whatever. And then I don't have to do the exact same thing. But I kind of already have those days scheduled too because I was so busy on these other days doing all the other autopilot things. And when you're on autopilot all the time, then it just makes sense. When I'm on autopilot, I'm not consciously doing things. The autopilot is. I'm just going along for the ride. right? If I'm in a plane, it's on autopilot. I'm hoping that the autopilot is doing what it's supposed to, which it is. But I'm just riding. I'm not making decisions. If I'm in a vehicle, a car... You know, it's on cruise control. I'm not doing anything. It's set on, it's driving itself. It's on cruise control. When your life's on autopilot, then it becomes incredibly difficult for you to begin to even access what you want because you don't have any time with yourself. You can be by yourself and still not have time with yourself. What does that mean? Because you can have so many autopilot to do items that you don't even get to yourself. Even though you may literally be by yourself or maybe nobody else around you in that room or in that flat or in that apartment at that moment or in that office, it's irrelevant because all the stuff you're doing, all the things you're thinking about, all the things you're processing in your mind are all these autopilot items. I have to think about this. I have to do this. And even though you're literally physically alone, you're still not able to have any alone time to access what you want because everything that you're thinking and processing cognitively is already filled with all these other demands. So the first part of being able to ask for what you want is being able to say to yourself that you matter. Yeah, you. Not as you as a conduit to other people. So you're going to, you know, you, yeah, people, you matter because if you're not, you know, if you're the, you're the manager. So if you don't write the schedules out, then nobody has their schedules. People can't get their, you know, get stuff done. No, I mean beyond that. I don't, I don't mean, okay, you're, you know, you're a caregiver. So yeah, if you're not there to... To, to coordinate the you know the caregiving transportation and that won't get done. I mean you as a person, like you as a as a human, you matter. So that means that you have to prioritize your time and allocate some of your mental capacity just for you. And again, we talked about in that idea generation location show how you do that. And so I went through all the different suggestions for potentially getting into a pattern or practice of an actual space. It could be a closet. It could be a, a restroom. It could be, you know, in the shower. It could be on a commute. It doesn't matter. But you have to get into a pattern and practice of this is a priority. I'm a priority. Spending time with me, focusing on my wants, is important. So as you go through and you and you process through that and you are doing that and you are spending time with yourself, you find a whole bunch of things that are really uncomfortable. One, you start to ask yourself all kind of questions. How much of the autopilot stuff do I really like? How much of it do I wish would go away? What makes me joyful? What makes me miserable? These are tough questions for all of us. Why do I do the things I do? 
Why do I repeat behavior that gives me really bad outcomes? Why do I avoid behavior that would give me awesome, extraordinary outcomes? What am I really frightened of? How do I really feel about myself? All of these are tough, very uncomfortable questions. The challenge is if we don't force ourselves, and I do mean force, I mean force ourselves to do this, then we're never going to have an opportunity potentially to, to honestly assess and own our own emotions and desires and feelings and wants. So that this is this is why I keep mentioning all these other shows because there's so much that goes into this first part of this equation, which is asking for what you want. You got to know what it is. My argument often is that you do know, and sometimes I'm very blunt about that. And I'll, and I give examples, and I say, well, if I ask you if you do, you know do you like chocolate, you know, you tell me yes or no. And if I asked you how you knew that, you'd say, well, I ate it and I liked it, or you'd say I ate it and I thought it was horrible and I never want to eat it again. And my argument often is it's the same thing with most everything else in life. Like you really do know, but you don't want to say it for fear of triggering other things, abandonment, regret, fear. Maybe you really d- d- don't like what you're doing at all, but you're scared to death But if, that if you did something else, it'd be even worse. So all of this, and we have so many shows, obviously this is show 207, so we're just getting started. I don't know why I say that. I mean, I, I'm saying it now, and I imagine. You know, I remember when I did, you know, show 7, you know, or show 107. I'm certain when I do show 7,000. You know, if I was fortunate to, to keep working that long, I'd still be just as much like, I've got a lot to say. We've never covered this. And this that's why this show topic today is so interesting because it brings in two different parts of this equation. The first part is the understanding what you want to be able to ask for it. The next part, though, is to be prepared to get it. And that's the part that really just grabbing me just by my, you know, by my heart today because – Assuming that, and I, get, and I threw out a lot of different uh, potential resources in our shows for you to, to start with. Assuming that you got, okay, and you're like, all right, I know, I, I have a list. I'm working on what I want. I'm always asking myself. I'm thinking. I'm trying to make good choices for me uh, and practice the joyful art of, of, of business and life. And you say, okay, and, and okay, ask for what you want. Now, asking for what you want is a whole other challenge, right? Because then you have to have the confidence and you have to have so much self-esteem that you're willing to risk all of the potential negative outcomes of being vulnerable. It's one thing to go sit in your idea generation location, which may be your shower or your toilet or your you know, train ride and to, to work, and secretly have your list of what you want, which is always changing, right? It's not set in stone. Sometimes I look back at stuff and I think, I wanted that? Really? <laughs> okay. Um, you know, but the the issue is when you have it, that's hard enough. I mean, that's really difficult. That's why it's the heavy lifting part is, is accessing that yourself. It's very, it's ongoing, right? It's an ongoing uh, issue where you confront yourself. But then being vulnerable enough to let other people know what some of those things are is really scary. Now, some of what you do when you ask for what you want is you ask yourself, right? But often you have to, have some action and interaction with other people. So let's say that you were someone and you manage your household and there are committees uh, at your, you have an elderly relative who is part of your a family unit. And so you spend a lot of your time uh, taking care of their needs and monitoring uh, medical issues and transportation issues and uh, taking them uh, for uh, treatment. And there is a um, volunteer group of people who have uh, similarly uh, situated um, loved ones. And you guys all interact with each other when you go to Uh, a senior community center and there's a committee at the senior community center and it's putting on a talent show and you in your hardest heart secret wish is to be in the talent show and to juggle 
because you juggled before and you loved it, but it's a secret thing. You never get to do it now because you have no time because you're on autopilot, but you would love to be juggling in that senior talent show. Now, this is, of course, for your family member there, the, that's mainly who it is, but the people who are on the committee that are helping put it together and get it together will also be able to have roles and contribute. And you really want to be in it and, and juggle. That's what you really want to do. Not necessarily by yourself, maybe juggle with, with another person, maybe one of the, one of the senior uh, members of the, of the actual uh, group, but you want to do that, right? Now that sounds like a simple thing. The heartbreak people have over not asking for that. So instead of you saying to, to the people in the group, when they're talking about getting it together and saying, okay, who's going to do lighting and who's going to help us make sure we got the schedules and who's going to help, um, you know, arrange the room where we're going to be doing the talent show. Instead of you speaking up and saying, um, hi, hey, I, you know, I don't know if everybody knows me. You know, my name is, you know, Talisha and I juggle and I'm telling everybody right now that I really am going to be in a talent show and, and juggling and, and I'm really excited. And is, is anybody else a juggler? You know, I don't care how you do it, but but being vulnerable and letting other people know what you want. When you're in the habit of doing it, it's really easy. Because you get used to it because you get really good outcomes. The good outcome is that you asked for what you wanted and then you got it. Or you asked for what you wanted and you were prepared to get it. Or you asked for what you wanted and you didn't get it. But guess what? Or since you mentioned to everybody in the room that you're a juggler, somebody else came up to you later and said, hey, one of my uh, grandkids is having a birthday party. Do you juggle for like kids parties? And all of a sudden, even though that hadn't been what you initially wanted, you wanted to be in the talent show at the senior center. But now somebody else mentioned another way to do juggling and you're thinking this could be kind of cool. See, opportunities open up. When you don't ask for what you want, then you're not going to get what you want. Now, some people say, well, that's not true. I could not ask for what I wanted. I could have never said anything about I wanted to juggle. And then somebody else could have just said, hey, don't you like juggling? Or didn't I see you juggle one time? And then that could have just happened anyway. Okay. The thing where we wait on other people to magically mind read what we're thinking and then magically, like Santa Claus, bring us our wishes is, I believe, offensive. I'm offended by that. I'm offended by that because this whole program, this entire business, and I mean that in the endeavor, as I just said, I wanted to do, you know, if I lived to do 7,000 shows, I'd be happy. It's built on surpassing goals. It's built on taking responsibility to be for being an adult and for being alive. And part of that responsibility is to, yeah, to recognize that it's a solemn occasion, that the day today exists. That means something. Because this day on the calendar, it's not coming back around again. And I have a responsibility in my own life to be engaged enough, to be plugged in enough, to not just sit on autopilot, numb, but to feel things. And some of that's going to bring me joy. And yeah, I'm, I'm very, again, as I said at the outset, this is very emotional. It's one of the best things you know, that Edith Heslop, that my, my grandmother that I mentioned in the show, that uh, you get no more out of life than you demand, that one of the best legacies is that she really did go for it in life. She, I mean, she really did. I mean, I am not exaggerating. I mean, socially. I mean, with her friends. I mean, uh, playing cards, which she loved. I mean, listening to music. I mean, running a funeral home. I mean, in her church. I mean, just everywhere. Like, she, one of the, bigger than life, definitely. But, 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 but it made her happy. Not every second of every moment of every day, a lot of really horrible things happened in life to her. But on the, on the most of it, when she invited people to play cards, she did that because she liked those people and she liked playing cards. It was fun for her. When she turned music on and would listen to it, it made her happy. When she told really funny stories, it made her happy. When she made a real estate deal, it made her happy. You have to be, you, you have to be focused enough. Excuse me for that. You, you, you were recording here in the, in the studio and, and the, had a background noise. You have to be focused enough 
on understanding how sacred your life is. And what an opportunity this is right now. That whatever it is, and most of what we want, most of us don't have, most of us don't have unusually challenging things we want. Most of us don't have really specific, what I mean by unusually challenging is that thing like, well, I would only want to be uh, on, on playing tennis if I could play tennis um, in the Olympics. I would only want to juggle if I was going to be the world's most famous juggler. I would only want to plan uh, my grandchild's uh, you know, birthday party if it was going to be um, in, in a magazine for people uh, showing how fabulous it was. Like, when you do stuff like that, usually those people are very self-destructive because what they do is talk themselves out of any sem- sense of accomplishment because by setting up all these false parameters. So I won't be happy unless I win the Olympics. I won't be happy unless uh, the birthday party is, you know, covered in some sort of, you know, magazine. So now you've made it so that basically it'll never be anything happy because those expectations are so unrealistic and ridiculous. And people who do things like that, usually, like I said, it's because they, they're, they're frightened. And the easiest way to say, well, I, I don't have any regrets, is to, is, to, is to say, well, I, you know, I did all I could. It's beyond my control. And to play the victim. And we're not victims. Like I said, this is, this is sacred. Our lives. So most of the stuff that we want, me, you, a lot of the people that you might read about or see about uh, that are, quote, famous or super successful, they want the same thing. I want to feel good about myself. I want to have a nice day. I want to feel that people are benefited by my by my life. These things aren't where we sit and we just, in our mind, hope Santa brings us our, our, our fantasy gift. Because even with little children... In, in the states and a lot of parts of the world, the children write letters to Santa. Why do the children write letters to Santa? Well, because otherwise, how will Santa know what they want? It's actually an application of this show topic. The children ask for what they want, and they're prepared to get it. It also helps that when Santa receives the letters, if Santa has helpers, Santa may know to let the helper know that that specific gift or toy or experience, maybe the children, maybe the child asks Santa to go, uh, you know river rafting or maybe ask Santa for uh, you know to go to the zoo or something who knows but whatever it is then Santa might then be able to help understand how potentially to help achieve that maybe if it's possible or something close to that or at least acknowledge it right maybe Santa will come back and maybe Santa's helpers would say well Santa wasn't able to do the zoo because we don't have anyone a zoo anywhere near here and it's not anything that's in our budget yet Santa does have um an opportunity for us to have a you know really great you know book about the zoo or something or we can plan to go to the zoo you know next year asking for what you want is again going back to my core issue when you when you invest in that very difficult and uncomfortable process where you start asking yourself who are you and what do you want it it shows that you have value intrinsically when you ask for what you want, it also shows you have value. Now, again, ask is done in a healthy way. So you're not doing this from a place of anger and fear. Right? Anger and fear would be, I told you I wanted to juggle. And if nobody here lets me juggle, I hate you all. That's a place of anger and fear and insecurity. Asking for what you want is letting people understand some of the vulnerabilities. That's important to you. It was important to you to lead that birthday party. It was important to you uh, to be in that meeting. It was important to you that you uh, bowled well. I mean, whatever it is, it was important. It was important to you that you did well in this sporting event. If you're an athlete, then yeah, it mattered to you. Now, someone else may say, why are you upset that you didn't do well in some stupid game? It's a game. Yeah, you know it's a game, but it was important to you. Someone else could say, why do you care about juggling? It's some stupid juggling thing. It's some stupid center for seniors. Nobody will even see it. And you'd say, I know that, but it mattered to me. Someone else might say, well, why do you want to be on that uh, committee for the grandkids, uh, uh, you know, event. And you might say, I know it's just a thing for the kids, but it mattered to me. It doesn't matter. You don't have to justify yourself. You exist and you feel this thing. Just like if someone said, I asked their example, I use a lot, you know, do you like chocolate? Someone says, I, yeah, I love it. I eat it. I like it. 
You don't have to justify that. Sharing your secrets of what you want with other people, again, being vulnerable. The risk, of course, is that other people will know what you want and they'll use it against you. And to be very frank and candid, that often happens. When you're in an unhealthy, toxic, or abusive relationship, that's exactly what happens. And a lot of adults get to a place where they don't ask for what they want and they're not prepared to get it because they were taught, they were conditioned early, maybe in a family of origin, maybe in a culture or a larger society, maybe in a school or a group setting, it doesn't really matter where, but they learned early on life that when you tell people what you want, then you're in deep trouble. Because you tell them what they want, what you want, and instead of them doing everything we can, we set an example where Santa's helpers will try to help. We can't take you to the zoo. We'll have a book about zoos. We can talk about, you know what I mean? But there are other people in toxic, abusive uh, environments where when you let somebody know what you want, then that is ammunition for them to use it against you. And not only are you never going to go to the zoo, but they'll do everything they can to cause that. They'll, sh- they'll embarrass you. They'll cause shame around them. And so when we look at this topic, and I said it's very emotional, it seems simple. Duh, ask for what you want. If you don't ask for it, how will you get it? Duh, the topic says ask for what you want and be prepared to get it. What's the big deal? Most, some people, not most, some people would say, I don't understand why this is even a quote. It's nothing. My argument is that this is a very, very powerful issue that has multiple layers. One is knowing what you want, being honest with yourself. The other thing is asking yourself for permission. Then being able to vocalize or, or share in a larger societal comp. Uh, um, uh, context what it is you want and then the other really very very important issue is are you mentally prepared for that for it succeeding we've done so many programs where we we talk about people not applying for jobs and and i get really passionate in, in those programs so um I'll put links on the show page and again, come to the site and look around. But some of those shows, right. And I get really frustrated and I say, you got to apply for jobs. You got to apply for jobs. You don't think you're qualified for. Right. And to me, it's so obvious. How on earth are you ever going to get anywhere if you're not in there competing? But the, the reason that people don't apply for a job or, you know, if somebody was in a personal life and they said, I'm lonely, not, not that I'm alone. You can be alone and not be lonely, but they'll say, I'm lonely. I'm sad. I, 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 I'm, I, I'm hurting because of this. And you'll say, well, you got to get out and meet people, right? That's what everybody will say. To, not everybody. I'm throwing out a lot of generalities today. <laughs> um, that's what people will say, right? So somebody's like, oh, I'm lonely. You say, well, go out and meet people. What's the problem, right? But the person, whether it's applying for jobs or going out and meeting people to them, it, it, you might as well say to them, you know, why, why aren't you going to, you know, planet Mars? And, you know, because they say, how am I going to get there? How am I going to get to planet Mars? I don't have a spaceship. I don't even know how to get to planet Mars. Uh, I think I'm going to die out there and when I leave um, our atmosphere. I don't, I don't know anything about this. And it's, it's just as difficult for them to go out and apply for a job if they don't believe, if they're not prepared to get it. And it's just as hard for them to go out and meet people because they'll, they, they're not prepared. Their fear isn't that they'll meet somebody and the person will be a horrible person or mean or, or a bad person or the person will reject them. I mean, that's bad enough. But their real deep fear is that they would go and meet somebody. What if that person really did potentially care for them? What if that person was that opportunity in an entirely new life where you really – respect and share and bond with someone where you rely on someone where you worry about someone that's their fear their fear isn't i'm not going to apply for the job i don't think i'm qualified the real fear is what if i got that job i don't think i'm good enough and just using just those words i don't think i'm good enough i don't think i deserve it I have had times in my life where people have used words like that. And even just thinking about it is so upsetting because it's it's been part of them violently denying themselves a, a life that would be fantastic for them. And it's them locking themselves in a little 
prison of pain. This is all one issue. I have to prioritize my my wants. I have to acknowledge my intrinsic value. I have to ask myself for what I want. I have to be brave and love and respect myself and this life and this day enough to put it out into society, whether it's friend, family, work, my wants. And then I have to be, before I even start this whole thing, be prepared to get what I want. And that is the stumbling block. For so many people, and it's so painful because you'll see people and you'll think, okay, so many good choices, right? Honest, um, tenacious, but they don't, they're not prepared to get what they want. So they'll self-sabotage the whole way down that chain of events to make sure they don't get to that point. The reason why the words be prepared, be prepared in this show topic are so fundamental is because that's what those of us who don't care about ourselves intentionally do we're not prepared because we we say to ourselves why would I prepare for that it's not going to happen to me good stuff like that doesn't happen to me that won't happen to me so we're not prepared to get what we want so then if it does accidentally happen we sabotage it we sabotage it. We say, well, I would, you know, what was I supposed to do? I mean, it was too much pressure. I mean, people expected so much of me. No, it wasn't that. If you see yourself as a worthy person, you know what you are? You're a worthy person. If you see yourself as not good enough, you're not good enough. The really great and freeing and easy part of this, it's all free. It costs no money. And it actually doesn't even take that much time. It just takes a consistent commitment. It is you defining what you want based on the intrinsic value that you have and that means you deserve respect it means you deserve uh, integrity it means that yeah you you are you are worthy if that's the foundation then all the rest of it's pretty simple well you think to yourself okay well I'm worthy why not me and I'll mention that phrase in, in programs and, and speeches and people sometimes will say, you say that often, why not me? Because honestly, candidly, <laughs> transparently, as I unfortunately sometimes uncomfortably feel, that's what I say to myself. When I'm, when I'm brushing my teeth or especially when I'm stressed out about something or I'm scared, I literally say to myself often out loud, I say to myself, why not me? And what that means is, exactly what it sounds like why not there's not anything inherently grotesque about me there's not anything inherently flawed or or not deserving about me i'm here i'm breathing let's look all the other humans why not me now that doesn't mean that i'm gonna do a great super awesome job it doesn't mean that i won't make mistakes or fail or mess up it does and what it means is the foundation of intrinsic value. This is my shot at this life so that I, my only hope would be, whether it's you know, a second from now or who knows when in the future, that whenever my time in this life as I know it is up, that similar to the, my grandmother, as I shared with you, 
in that show that I that that's that I really did get it all done. Not it all like I you know climbed you know the summit of every mountain and and you know went to Mars and all that. Not like that, but what for stuff that I want for the things that brought me joy that I did. I didn't sit around and 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 not take a chance or not do the stuff that made me happy that I did it. That's all, and that is a rare thing. But you, to, to get to that place, you got to start with, I have intrinsic value. However you get there. Some people have a spiritual or religious or cultural or political. Or I don't care how you get there. Philosophical, you know, um, political. Like, whatever works for you, whatever is part of how you see yourself and define yourself, do that. But yes, why not you? Then you make a list of your wants. Some of the wants may be a bit more universally universally understood. Things like, oh, I want to be of service to others. I want to feel like I contribute to society. Things like that. Some of them would be more specific and other people may even ridicule. I've shared in many programs. I've talked about when I started doing um, uh, seminars and motivational speaking, other lawyers and other people la- literally laughed at me and teased me. And were like, really? <laughs> the thing is, I don't care. Not that I don't care about their opinion. They have the right to their opinion. My point is, I did that because I wanted it. I asked for what I wanted. I was prepared to get it, and it made me happy. And I practice my joyful art of business every time I do it. This is my shot in this body, in this life, at this day. And I'm going to take it. And I really do think, why not me? And by, by doing that, it prevents a ton of problems. I never sit around and think, what if I'm not good enough? What if they don't like me? Other other people deserve it. What if I fail? I fail all the time. I'm sure. <laughs> the community members are, you know, things happen. It didn't go like I expected. Uh-oh, well, you just keep moving. Why not me? You have to visualize. And for more about, more importantly than visualizing, you have to actually feel. I mean, like, physically feel that, yes, mm -hmm, I'm prepared. I am prepared. I am prepared. Mm -hmm. Because when you you feel that, not like you, because, you know, we have so many things to talk about, right? We have programs where people say, oh, I feel like I'm, you know, like I'm, 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 I'm just pretending and, and people will see through me that I don't deserve to be there or I'm not, you know, good enough or whatever. All this stuff. People say, well, other people are smarter than me or they're more talented than I am or they, you know, golly, look, hey, here's the thing. You're you, I'm me. We are, have intrinsic value as humans. This isn't about any imagined victimhood. You're not a victim. Yes. Are other people smarter than you? Are other people smarter than me? Yeah, of course. Are other people more talented? Yeah, obviously. Are other people uh, make better choices? Yeah. Uh, look, why not me means that this entity is exactly as it is. And why not me means it's going to keep being exactly as it is. So, so you do something, it's a catastrophic failure. Oh, well, you learn. Maybe, uh, maybe you, you try something and you realize, well, that wasn't really, uh, my area of expertise. Okay. How do you learn? Right. You're here. I'm here. That is such a gift. You must be prepared to get what you want. Otherwise the whole thing fails and that's you self-sabotaging back down that chain of events. When you're prepared to get what you want, then you're not going to accept things that aren't anywhere near there. So if in your mind you think, you know what, I do deserve to have a great uh, community of caring. And that may be friends, family, uh, could be any anybody. Anybody who meets the test, I mention the test all the time, your happiness is their happiness and their happiness is your happiness, right? But you have to be prepared for it to get that. So people who aren't will come from a place of, oh, I'm not good enough. My wants don't matter. I don't ask for what I what I what I want, and then they say I'm lonely, and I don't, and I I'm just not deserving, and then the, whoever that unfortunately sort of accidentally crosses their path in life, even if that person is abusive, or neglectful, or gives them the silent treatment, or disrespects them, or ignores them, in their mind they'll tolerate it, because they were never prepared to get what they wanted anyway. 
if they had been the moment that person started to act like that <laughs> they would be like okay i my intrinsic value uh flawed as i am know what i want and i'm prepared and i asked for it and i'm prepared to get it and this is not it right so if somebody disrespects or, or stole from you or, or or had physical violence or insulted you or put you down or called you ugly or names, you would immediately recognize this is not what I wanted. See, I, I knew what I wanted, right? That's the first part. And then I talked to myself about it. Okay. And then I had my whole foundation that I keep refreshing. Why not me? Right? Why not? I have value equal. I'm a human intrinsically. And then you, I asked for it. Right? And then this other entity, right, came into life. And then now they started doing something that's not what I wanted. I didn't want somebody to call me ugly and, and be cruel. Now that happened. So, uh-oh, that's not what I want. I'm prepared for what I want. I am not prepared for this, so I will not tolerate this. So just move on to something else. It really is that easy. When you set this up, the whole thing, it feeds itself. So if you ask for what you want and you have enough confidence in yourself to understand, yeah, other people, you're putting yourself out there to be vulnerable. So people may laugh or that people may cry people may yell most people of course will ignore us because most people don't know we exist which is normal and healthy we talked about that in shows before did a show about feeling invisible specifically um but it's not about them it's about what i wanted and if it makes me happy to juggle if it makes me happy to plan somebody's birthday party if it makes me happy to you know put green stripes in my hair if it makes me happy to dance you know at the bowling alley if it makes me happy you know that's what i'm doing now of course within the law within uh, being ethical and all this kind of good stuff, but this isn't about them. This is about me. I said, "What? Well, this is what this says. Ask for what you want, and be prepared to get it. Be prepared means mentally in my mind before I even asked for it, I was ready for it. I was ready for it, right? And I was prepared. So it wasn't a lot of people. What they'll do is say, "Well, I did. I I did ask, or I I thought, or I meditated, or some people have a, a, a religious. I prayed, or I went to my family and friends, or you know, and and I did, and then nothing happened. Well, no, the be prepared part is again, like I said, it's it's everything. I'm prepared for what I want. It may not come exactly as I thought right so it may be that i want to juggle and i want to juggle in this event but i didn't get to be in the talent show but i did get to juggle somewhere else see i got what i wanted i'm prepared for it i'm prepared before i even ask for it because i'm ready for it so many people are nowhere near this they ask for stuff and usually they'll ask for stuff it's not even what they want but they just ask for it because what everybody else is asking for which is ridiculous then if by some horrible stroke of bad luck for them they actually do get something that they really wanted and they cared about they're so embarrassed That's what I said earlier. People sometimes will, sometimes in a snide way, say, oh, you're so emotional. You're always so passionate. You got so much energy. It's not meant as a compliment. And what I think what the the underlying point is, you know, it's really, why does it have to be so, you know, over the top? Why do you care so much? The deal is, I do. Now, why I care so much about the things that I want is a whole interesting area that I haven't, you know, I don't have the answer to all of it. But I could tell you, you know, do I like chocolate? Do I like Brussels sprouts? Uh, Do I like uh, dancing? I can tell you answers to that. Why? I'm still working through a lot of the whys. I don't really know necessarily for all of it, but I do know I do like it. So if I like it and I feel that it made me feel better by being uh, passionate or theatrical or emotional or blunt or whatever then i do that and i'm prepared for it because it was what i wanted and the and the and the positive outweighs the negative what other people want or what other people think about me um understand that most people don't think about us at all we did a wonderful show on that a while ago the eleanor roosevelt quote right if you realize uh you wouldn't worry so much about what other people think about you if you realize how little they do so that's first of all i think about that a lot that most people don't think about me at all so who cares not in a negative way, but in, look, they're on their path, it's their life. I'm on my path, it's my life. Hopefully, people will be part of my community of caring, and I'll be part of their community of caring, right? My happiness is their happiness, their happiness is my happiness. But even if some that doesn't happen, I'm going to keep doing those things that brought me what I wanted. And when I see stuff that comes along and I would prepare for what I wanted, but this isn't what I wanted, the person abused me or the, the relationship soured, then I recognize immediately this was not what I was prepared for. I was very specific when I said what I wanted. This is not it. Then I'm, I very easily can recognize that, identify it, and then stop it. 
I can't stop the person from behaving the way they do, but I can stop me being there for when they do it. Because I got to go on somewhere else and be doing that thing I was prepared for. I was prepared for this this thing that I wanted. I don't want this negative thing. That's not what I was prepared prepared for. Thus, I'm not able to stay here and accept it. When you start this system and you build it and you repeat it and you repeat it and you repeat it, as I said, as you keep doing it, it gets really easy because you just get used to it. You get used to taking time for your idea generation location and investing in yourself. What do I want? And then looking at the things that you already thought you wanted before and realizing I really don't want that anymore. <laughs> and uh, continually evolving on that. And you're really confident and excited to ask for what you want because you've learned in time that, that there have been really interesting, exciting, novel fulfilling things that have happened so it gives you more confidence to keep trying this stuff and because you were prepared way before you even started asking yourself what you wanted you're prepared for getting what you wanted then when the outcome that you were prepared for happens you're ecstatic this is awesome now even when you do all of that and the outcome that you wanted comes to fruition and then you move forward and realize you were you know you failed or it was a disaster (laughs) this really isn't your your area of expertise that's okay it's a learning experience sometimes you might you know some people sometimes say oh you're so self-deprecating no not necessarily i just try to be really honest i do get it i just know that the the quest of exploring what i want and getting out in the universe and asking with the understanding ahead of time that I'm ready, I'm prepared to get it. That's fun and it's interesting and it's exciting. And even when it's boring and it's dull, it still gives me enough anticipation and excitement when I wake up. What could happen? Maybe a day where nothing happens. Maybe I do laundry. I don't know. But there's a potential for something to happen because I'm constantly going through this process. What do I want? How do I, I'm asking for it. And I'm and before I asked, before I even identified it, I was prepared to get it. That's what opens up new opportunities. So as I, as I shared uh, this uh, specific topic, take it seriously. And I, we, we tried to break down the other, you know, the different parts of it, the discrete parts of it. First of all, what do you want? You need to go and spend a lot of time on that if, if that's an issue for you. If you know what it is that you want, you feel, and you say to yourself, I have intrinsic value, your version of my, why not me? Then why aren't you asking for it? That's a whole other issue. So it's something to do with your perception of yourself and society. Why not you? And that, and that understanding of the other people's reaction is that. Um, okay. You're ready for it. You can handle it. And then more exciting, you already were prepared before you even asked to get it because when you get it then that's when something interesting really happens because especially if it's something novel or different you really do test yourself (laughs) that's when you find like i said i found i i find out the majority of the time oh okay well then i really don't think um motorcycle riding is going to be my new talent didn't mean i didn't enjoy it it just meant this probably this doesn't seem like it's my talent but i still did it and i learn every time and it also encourages me to go back to the well Find out again what I want, and then ask for it, and be prepared to get it, and just keep doing it because it's fun. And I, as I said earlier, I don't, I don't hope for much. And as many people who, for time with me, some people say, you know, too much of cynicism, and I don't. But I do, even in my most uh, desolate frames of of mind, I do think to myself, it wasn't only my grandmother. I had I had some other awesome examples in my real life of people that I admire in how they they got what they wanted out of life. And it's such a good thing. And and by comparison I also have too many examples of people who never did any of this they didn't take the time they didn't trust themselves they didn't value themselves they didn't ask for what they wanted they didn't they weren't prepared to get it and when their time in 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 this life as we know it in the body as we know it was up it's just heartbreaking because there's so much they left undone
So you and I, we're here now. Let's let's keep doing it. And again, as I said at the outset, what a what a wonderfully splendid life uh, Maya Angelou lived, and she continues every day to live through the legacy, the ideas, and the wonder and the beauty of it all that she's left for all of us. Why not you? Thank you.